So um, I call this talk Beyond Significant Terms. Um, maybe a bit ambitious title, but uh, it's about using Elasticsearch for word level analysis. So first briefly about me and the company I work in, Comperio. Comperio is a Norwegian consulting company specializing in search and uh, related technologies. Um, it focuses on search, recommendations, analytics, and other related technologies. Uh, aside from that, uh, I'm a current PhD candidate in natural language processing, uh, focusing in machine learning and statistical techniques. And I uh, work in Compare, I work on projects uh, using Elasticsearch and E4J, among other things. So, um, looking a bit uh, into the talk, um, we're going to um, look at how um, search is a great metaphor for uh, making robust analysis uh, with, uh, with rather few resources. Um, and how aggregations, and especially the significant terms aggregation, uh, gives us a real-time retrieval of key lexical statistics. And uh, uh, considering time, you know, as time allows, we're going to look at some examples of, uh, of lexical analysis. So um, this is perhaps not uh, new for anybody here, but uh, Elasticsearch is a search engine, free text search engine. and um, um, it focuses on data aggregation and analytics and um, has uh, kind of moved on from uh, its search roots in, into these kind of areas. And it's also a highly scalable kind of NoSQL data store. So um, what I'm going to talk about here is, is based on a current project. Um, I'm sad to say that I can't really say that much about it. This is kind of one of the screens. And, um, but it's an open source intelligence collection and analysis tool um, that is open source as in public information. Um, and the project places some rather tight constraints on, on how we solve problems. Uh, the scope is rather ambitious and, uh, and we don't really have too much money to spend. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, also we have to handle uh, some languages that are not really commonly uh, available in, in, uh, in tools. And also we have to handle uh, some sources and document types that are also kind of a bit uh, different from what you might normally uh, normal meet. So just briefly going to to introduce uh, the setting, this is uh, kind of the technical pipeline. It has a RabbitMQ ingestion pipeline. There's an, an enrichment step. And it populates Elasticsearch indexes and Neo4j graph database. There's an application layer, which feeds an analysis front and, 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 um, and, and various external feeds. So, um, um, and in, and in this context of this application, uh, significant terms and other aggregations in Elasticsearch kind of fit perfectly with our philosophy of making kind of dumb systems act intelligent. Um, so um, kind of you might want to call this um, the beauty of not having to be correct all the time, actually. And what does this mean? Well, it means that uh, you might want to simplify the system scope. Uh, so, what does that mean exactly? You know, um, can we predict more coarsely, for example, instead of predicting precise positions? Might we just kind of predict that something is there at all? Um, if you're doing something over a time window, we might want to do it over lots of time windows and aggregate the results. Um, <clears throat> and this kind of thinking brings in more relevant data and kind of adds robustness. And it, and it decreases the degrees of freedom in the system, in the model, if you're going to put it into kind of machine learning statistical terms. Also, uh, another aspect is, uh, can we elicit from the users knowledge that we can use? So this is kind of time-honored old artificial intelligence technique. It goes back to ELISA. And, and uh, I think it's uh, pretty much popular today. 
with, thing, with the systems like Google, is kind of an expert of kind of showing you where you want to go based on where you've been. So uh, back to significant term segregation. Uh, I don't know if everyone is familiar with it, but um, it, its presentation in Elasticsearch documentation and in the presentation is kind of, I find it a bit disappointing because it's kind of presented as, as magic. It's like then commonly, commonly, common and common. And, and the details is kind of uh, glossed over a bit. Uh, this is not really very magic at all. So uh, it's mostly um, a comparison of t term frequencies. You get a background set of documents with t that you take the frequency of a term with. This is kind of like the dark green line here. You take your foreground set of documents, which is what you kind of you focus. And that's kind of like the light green line. And any kind of positive deviation, as we see, uh, indicates that the term is, is significant. So, um, so why, why do we come here with this? Well, um, personally, I like the significant terms aggregation quite a lot. It's, um, and, and this comes from a background. I find that the kind of bare kind of word lexical signal is very powerful. Uh, if you hear talks or get presented NLP, it, it, you get part of speech tag, you get parsing. But often, uh, the kind of the bare lexical signal, the relationships in words and the context they're in, is kind of very hard to beat for a lot of tasks if you're going to produce a system that behaves in a robust manner. So um, uh, it's also um, its kind of relationship to search, which is kind of arguably the most successful artificial, artificial intelligence or information retrieval application of all time. So uh, we retrieve a large set of documents, and um, we use an algorithm to rank them. And then we kind of just present the top that are kind of most most uh, sure about. So we take the part of the result that we like the best and we present it. The thing we're not sure about, we just kind of put down below the fold and, and uh, the user doesn't get to see it. Um, that's kind of a nice space to be in, I think, when you're making a system. So I'm going to talk briefly about um, using significant terms on single documents. So Elasticsearch doesn't really support this. They have kind of like a minimum document count, and you can go below it. But as it turns out, it never kind of um, does anything useful. Uh, and that is because, uh, basically what's on this slide, it's the JLH. It's kind of the default scoring algorithm used for significant terms. Um, it's not really very well documented. But if you look at it, it's uh, the frequent for this uh, first equation. Different of frequencies of the foreground and the background. Uh, multiplied by the ratio of the foreground and the background. So it turns out this kind of linear term is kind of pretty relevant. So it basically boils down to this, the ratio between the square of the foreground and the background. It turns out that uh, the term segregation kind of lies behind there, so it retrieves document frequencies. And if you have a single document, that is one, and you end up with an inverse document frequency of the background set, which means what you see from the significant terms aggregation is actually um, a list of the various terms in the background set in your document. To add insult to injury, it sorts them out alphabetically. So we kind of get all the rare terms of the background set that begins with A. So um, often it doesn't, isn't really very useful. So what we had to do is to the, create a new score uh, that will let us do significant terms style uh, scoring on a single document. Um, <clears throat> so we want to keep these, that we want to bring things, that, four things that are uncommon, uh, but still are common enough, basically. And uh, I might summarize that as kind of like a Pareto style scoring, this kind of 5, 15, 80 kind, kind of uh, separate. Uh, of this kind of uh, curve here, where we want this juicy, kind of informative, that's not too common and not too common. The scoring we use is the one you see here. It's uh, basically the, a TF-IDF and an additional factor. Um, and um, and uh, <coughs> uh, so the TF kind of, it brings the document in, the IDF kind of brings out the uh, common things, and um, 
the middle term is actually a bit kind of situational because if you have a very noisy data set, this is kind of an in-domain IDF, IDF, which will kind of um, suppress noise that is in the domain. If you have very clean data, you might want to bring forth structure from the domains and then you use a document frequency instead. Um, this tends to work a lot better than kind of just running the significant terms on a single document. It's also nice to mention that in Elasticsearch, you can do very kind of, um, you can actually do the TF-IDF calculations in arbitrary terms as a query. So um, TF-IDF is kind of the central weighting term for a lot of relevant scoring for text. And it's kind of a basic building blocks for a lot of machinery that you might want to build. So it's very nice to have it. You can actually use the term segregation actually has all the things you need to build um, and um, IDF score, and then uh, you can uh, retrieve the term frequency from the term vectors. And you can do that it's in batches. So everything you need is there, and it's very, very fast. It's a lot faster than the original significant term query, actually. So, so these are the building blocks, building blocks we use. And uh, then we're going to see a bit at kind of some applications. So the first uh, is entity extraction. And um, uh, ended extraction is kind of um, coming from an um, academic standpoint, and in practice, it's a pretty difficult problem. So, just a brief introduction is basically finding things in text. And as you see uh, in this kind of example, there's um, you're not only finding the things, you're saying what it is and where they are in the text. Um, and um, as I said, it was difficult, but there are some very good solutions for English and, and, and other major languages. For us, it's, um, that's kind of um, not very comforting because we have uh, languages beside English that is not really covered. There's no training data of this sort to build a machine learning solution. And, um, also, you need a lot of kind of entities lists, gazetteers, um, public uh, indexes, or whatever. These, these can be hard to obtain, actually. So uh, in addition, we will kind of cheat a bit, doing our cheap as a version. So instead of just kind of pinpointing exactly what it is and what it is, we're just going to list them. We're just going to list the top entities in our text. We're not gonna, even going to do what's going to indicate in the figure there. We're not going to say what it is even. We're just going to say it as an entity, and that's it and rank the entities by relevance. And this gives us a lot of flexibility in terms of quality as experienced by the user because the, uh, he just gets to see the part of the result that we're kind of pretty confident about uh, and, uh, and uh, if we even show them to him, which, which we do. Um, and, um, and he's not going to laugh that we didn't find anything or that we, we did something wrong. So yeah, some arrows there. Um, okay, so the, to summarize the idea, we're going to use high recall heuristics to um, to scoop up as many entities as possible, along with a lot of other stuff. Actually, um, it's going to collect potential entities with a very wide net. We hope to kind of have 100% as close to 100% recall. And then we're going to um, uh, score these entities with significant terms. And um, finally, we're actually going we're gonna to use whatever kind of cheap knowledge resources we got to kind of uh, fix up the result we get. Um, so for a kind of concrete example, we're going to scoop up a lot of capitalized terms. This is like a 25 character regex, so it's not a big piece of engineering. Um, we're going to use significant terms based on IDF, domain IDF, as described earlier. So this is very noisy mail list data. It, con it contains a lot of crap. It contains code listings, a lot of kind of uh, sightings, and all manner of signatures and ugly stuff, which makes, actually makes it difficult. And then we're going to, I say re-ranking, but we're going to pick up entries from DBpedia that are actually relevant and, and bring out, out those. So this is kind of how it looks. It's a bit small, but so the text at the top is uh, is uh, is the text. I'm gonna I highlighted um, the various results. 
Um, and the first line is the 10 most relevant entities. It's got what are eight that I consider good. It's machine types, uh, technical, uh, technical stuff. It's, it's got uh, a nickname and a name. It's also got two entities that are kind of just capitalized things in the beginning of sentences, which are not useful. Um, and the blue ones in there are things in the middle of the ranking. The 10 at the bottom is the 10 bottom of the rankings, which is, which is mostly annoying stuff. But it's got um, two kind of misses here. It's got Intel, which is common, which is common in, uh, in, in the general domain and gets dra dragged down by the IDF there and gets snort. This is actually the snort mailing list. So uh, it gets dragged down by the um, in-domain IDF. Thankfully, uh, these can be queried out from Wikipedia and, and, and um, because this is software entities, software companies, it's pretty easy to get out. And, um, and uh, along with Red Hat Enterprise Linux at the top, which is, also, um, which is also kind of low in the ranking, and we can bring those out and kind of save this from being forgotten at the bottom of the ranking list. This actually helps us that very common things is actually more likely to be listed in such resources as DBpedia than, than the most common things that we, br that we bring up. Um, uh, DBpedia and Wikipedia are something that you should be, be a bit careful about, actually, because there's a lot of kind of odd structure and collections of stuff. If you start just matching up things, you'll get, you'll match up in near anything. So it tends to be a bit careful there and just kind of pick out the domains that you know are interesting. Um, we're doing trending keywords. This is kind of our key functionality in the applications. It's kind of discovering new topics of entities of interest. They're kind of um, having, um, getting a lot of interest in the resources. And um, it's kind of like a short uh, introduction. Um, basically, you look for increasing recent usage. And um, it's actually a very important functionality because it's, it's, it's something that makes a system a uh, living, self-developing system for analysts to kind of pick up on new things, add new sources, uh, and, and, uh, and add new functionality. They need to know what's developing, and this is one of the functionalities that helps them do that. Uh, the problem is that we often have very few documents to base our trends on. And uh, some trends, some sources kind of vary in topics. So uh, it kind of degenerates to just the last top, last message or last posting or whatever being the trend, which, um, which you know, isn't helpful to us. So they kind of tend to, tend to spike on the, just the immediate activity all the time. So uh, what we do is that we smooth the time intervals, we do significant terms to kind of drag this out, but we smooth them out. To do that, we need a relevant term scoring that significant term scoring that is actually comparable between different foreground and background sets, which the original scoring doesn't do. And then we want to compare different sources. That's also a key step to kind of uh, making this robust. Um, so, uh, as I said, increasing windows, and we have inverse Pavlov style of the rank, which is comparable. And then we look for things that are trending along. Different, uh, different sources. This is a small example. I think we don't really have a lot of time to look about it, but we see like in, in mid-month there's an exploit kind of, we have two sources here and the correlated terms. And, um, and uh, you see there's, there's, for example, an exploit trending mid-October mid in 2012. Um, we're just about out of time, so, um, um, I don't know if we get to talk a lot about the guided filtering. It's about creating filters for specialized topics. This is our analyst. He has an internal entity called HAL, and he gets a lot of messages that are not about what you want. Except the ratio of this can be from 1 to 10,000 to 1 to 100,000 for over relevant documents to relevant documents. So it makes the source completely useless to the analyst. And um, we would like to use significant terms to... Um, highlight um, uh, the terms that makes up the first stage of creating the filter that is actually based on the data and is actually relevant to the data sources, but also describes the topic. 
And um, for the analyst, uh, we're doing something like this, that um, the, the significant term looks for exploits at the background that, that is Linux, with the significant terms query. We get a lot of terms, and we group them by topic model, for example, the circles. We also group them by a lexical similarity model, where for things where we can't find assign them topics. So these are, for example, plugins, plugin modules are similar, exploit and scripts and nmap are similar, threat and attacks are similar. And we kind of call it the things that we think that the, for this kind of topic that analysts will pick up. Um, in, in red here, there's also a lot of kind of unsorted kind of entities on the, on the bottom. So um, sorry, I can't really have time to explain this fully, but I think we basically have time. Yeah. So thank you for watching. Uh, we're gonna, um, thank you for watching. We're gonna present a lot of the technical bits about this on a blog in the coming weeks. So if you're interested in this, you might want to um, Google that and, and check it out. Thank you. <laughs>